Greetings, cinephiles. I'm Sue Wright, and welcome to the Wild Rivers Film Radio, the official podcast of the Wild Rivers Film Festival on KCIW 100.7 FM. Today we're sitting down with director Rob Douthit to discuss his new film, Whiskey Floats. Director and cinematographer, he has more than 30 acting credits and he's probably best known for his stunts in the Twilight film series. He currently owns and operates a carbon neutral film equipment rental house in Brooklyn. But before we get started, we'd like to thank Wild Rivers Film Festival's presenting sponsor for 2024, KDRV Newswatch 12 out of Medford, Oregon. Thank you, Newswatch 12, for making the film festival possible this year. And this year's Wild Rivers Film Festival is also brought to you in part by the Talawadini Nation, Oregon Community Foundation, the Ford Family Foundation, Travel Curry Coast, the Roundhouse Foundation, the City of Brookings, and Pacific Rim Copy Center. Interested in sponsoring the Wild Rivers Film Festival and our mission to celebrate indie cinema on the Wild Rivers Coast? You can learn more on our website, wildriversfilmfestival.com. If this is the first you're hearing about the Wild Rivers Film Festival, we're so glad you're joining us. The Wild Rivers Film Festival is a celebration of indie and local cinema that happens during the third week of every August in Brookings. Over the course of four days, we screen more than four dozen films at three different locations across the city. Many of our film screenings feature Q&A sessions from visiting filmmakers, and our festival includes daily educational panels, VIP parties, and a not-to-be-missed awards ceremony on the final day of the fest. Passes are on sale now at wildriversfilmfestival.com. We can't wait to see you at the show. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Sue Wright, and today we're sitting down with Rob Douthit, director and cinematographer, to talk about his project, Whiskey Floats, and to tell us more about his career. Rob, welcome to the Wild Rivers Film Radio. Thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. This is great. I didn't know you had all of these microphones in Brookings. If I had known, I probably would have been here sooner. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, not that not that I wouldn't have expected as much, but you guys have multiple podcast studios in Brookings. That's great. It's an amazing little community. Yeah. And um, we'd like you to tell us a bit now about how you got into filmmaking. When did you get interested? And how did you pursue that passion? Wow. Well, I had um, the good fortune of the industry kind of coming into my backyard when I was... Um, in my mid-20s, and I think the, you know, I answered an extras casting call. I was a personal trainer at the time. I had just left college. I knew that I didn't know what I wanted to do next because my degrees were kind of aspirational without, you know, my desire. I didn't want to go to graduate school for what I was studying. So I responded to an extras casting call because Louisiana had all these tax incentives. So Benjamin Button, um, Battle Los Angeles, um, a bunch of other, you know, Dallas Buyers Club, all of these films filmed in Louisiana in that mid 2000s period. So I was right in the middle of it. I wanted to get involved. I was a personal trainer to an actor in the industry and also um, got in, uh, got into being a stand in for Nicolas Cage, Matthew McConaughey, you know, a bunch of other people who, you know, um, whose names I, you know, can't, can't exactly remember right now. But, but essentially it came to my backyard. So, I had to get involved with it because I knew it was something that was close to what I always wanted to do. And there comes this this time where you realize that what your plan is, is going to change. And for me, I remember hearing our guidance counselor in college instruct a bunch of us saying that the average person will change careers five times in their lifetime. So planning for one as though that's not going to change is already absent the evidence. There's a need to consider that plans could change. So for me, plans changed. They changed at an unexpected time after I had an injury and I couldn't uh, keep doing my personal training work because I couldn't physically spot people anymore. I had a neck injury after uh, a car accident and some weightlifting. So I didn't have anything left besides the acting classes I was in. I I called 
called up and said, look, I'll show up at any time. I can stand still. I, I, I can't lift anything, but I can stand <laughs> still. So that's what extras are great at doing it in some cases. And so I was able to do it. And then after a process of healing, I was able to do more in acting classes like that. So I got into class because someone put an extras casting call ad on the radio, um, you know, which was Caballero Casting, you know, which was out of Baton Rouge at the time. And I'm really grateful that they did it because I got to do so much, you know, and meet so many people. And it was the beginning of so many things. I met someone on the first day of set that I, I became a personal trainer for the actor with. I learned cinematography and editing, you know, without going to film school because I met all these people. And I was watching some of the world's greatest DPs in my backyard because the directors of photography because they were just there because the tax incentives made it possible. So it was a it was a unique opportunity that a lot of really smart people put together to create the circumstances that were necessary to bring films to my home state. And um, I, I have them to thank for that. And also all of the community leaders that led the grassroots effort to keep that alive for the whole time I was there. And then it got me to where I was introduced to a teacher who had a conservatory in New York. And then I went there to study study acting and I just kept kept rolling with my education with it. And it led to, uh, it led to things I didn't expect. And it's like a really good friend told me one time, you know, you start with you start with a lot of unknowns when you make a change, a big change. And in this case for me, that unknown was what was what good was going to come. I knew what I was leaving by leaving home. And hopefully not everybody has to leave home to do this. You know, that's not something that everyone should should have to do. But for me, leaving home had the unknowns of what I learned and it's been worth every So you had to take that leap of faith. Absolutely. There's in film everything involves faith unless unless you don't have direction because if you have an intention faith is required you know I, that right. this is my perspective other people don't have to share the same perspective but the long and the short of it is you'll get a lot of no in film so if you have a strong intention then you'll get a lot of yes and no always crumbles in the face of persistent yes so uh, my intention was so strong that i just didn't give up. Even whenever it really looked like I should, I still didn't. And then a lot of good things came after. So how do you make that leap from film school to a career in film and acting in cinematography? Well, for me, I, I had to ignore a lot of people's advice on that. A lot of people think that there's one thing that you should do. They understand that you are capable mentally, spiritually, and physically of doing that one thing. And they can't imagine you doing anything else. So, so you have a box. Your box has been created, and your job is to ignore that that has been created politely, kindly, and then with full understanding that people have their best intentions with you. And there's also social structures involved in this of expectations of what you ought to do. There's unions. Uh, you know, that also has a very good effect in some ways, too. But you have to explore in a way that, lead, that leads your energy to be its fullest. I, I, I can't give any, any advice that leads people to be discouraged for years of their life in this. There's too much mental capacity wasted in that. You have to consider that your best work is whenever you apply everything that you are to what you can do. And for me, that was not possible because I didn't get enough, enough job offers. So I had to flip to editing, to camera operating, to working in a commercial studio, you know, and then that made things possible. But to answer your question, how do you go from film school to a career? And how do you go from acting to directing or something else like that? Essentially, you don't like you develop an intention for your artwork and then people start to come along your path. My journey wasn't to go to film school and then transition from film school. I never went to film school. I went to an acting conservatory myself. To me, there was no better way to approach narrative films because actors are doing storytelling at every moment to moment to moment to moment. So um, it's possible for someone to go to an acting to a directing program that only has one acting class that they don't have to actually participate in acting in and have a lesser ability to tell a story as a director than by going to an acting school that really delves into that all the time and then trusting yourself to learn cinematography and hire a cinematographer to do that entire job. There is no acting coach by default on film sets. There is a cinematographer. So, so it's important to know an acting process to be a director. So that's how I got to where I am. But I'll also say that, um, if a person wants to go to film school, this is an important thing to know. You don't have to go to film school, especially the way the industry works now. You don't have to. But it speeds things up. And if you have the money or the capital or the support or the scholarship to go and you have the time to go, you should probably go because you're going to learn how the industry works before you have to get into it. 
you're probably going to get a bigger exp- a bigger exposure to film history and to paradigms that we trust in our culture. And then you're going to have a network after you leave. And the network is crucial, isn't it? It's the most crucial part. It's the most crucial part. I mean, because we have to take for granted that some people don't have the, the greatest abilities on earth and still make it. But you can't really get into this unless someone, including yourself, believes in you. But I think we know good acting when we see it. Certainly. I, I know the, the talk between Linklater and McConaughey and his dazed and confused set, and he wasn't even supposed to have a talking part. He's just supposed to be an extra. And, <laughs> and he got into the role, and Linklater right. saw him and said, hey, can you do this, and can you do this? And then Linklater helped launch his career. Right. And so Linklater he was going to be a actress. lawyer. He wasn't going to be in <laughs> <laughs> and he was in, in Lincoln Lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and Richard is such a great actor's director because he pays attention to and you know they they say that directing is casting. Uh-huh. If you're really going to be successful as a director, you cast well. And Matthew McConaughey, if you look at his old auditions, you knew that he was going to become yes. something. There was no question about Linklater it. Later so. could see that the first day. Right, and I, I believe I believe his Days Confused audition is actually available on YouTube on tape. I think you can see it, but. But long story short, Linklater understands what an actor is doing and, and facilitates it and makes it work. So um, and, and at least with when it came to Matthew McConaughey and Richard Linklater, they they created the best possible outcome. And an actor's career, this is something that my acting coach um, taught us in, in conservatory, was that an actor's career happens when an, an actor meets a piece of material, a certain story written a certain way that matches what that actor is. That is is what makes an actor's career work better than if you can transform into any random accent or dialect or you are emotionally plastic and can move yourself in every direction. Okay, what do people see in you and who have you been for your entire life? Who do you know how to be? And then does the director have a piece of material that matches that? Because your your humor, your rhythm, mm-hmm. your, your, your tonal uh, experience of life can match the project, you know, and 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 that's important for a director to see in an actor, I feel. When you came to Brookings the first time to yeah. help create a small town nutcracker story, you came as a director mm-hmm. and it was going to be your first feature. Yeah. Um, but then you also took a starring role as the uncle in the small town nutcracker. So can you say more about how you navigate directing and acting, um, especially given, you know, you're talking about coming at it, you know, this is kind of really you. It's a story you're passionate about. Right. And it, and it was, and, and it was a really important time for that story. Um, I, I would say to answer, how do you approach both of those roles? Never in ignorance of the other. In order to be a, a director of, there was something like 85 children on the call sheet, um, varying levels of acting experience, some of them very good. Um, yes. In theater, no film experience. No film one. experience on that cast. <laughs> Be- because of what Brookings was in 2020, now there has been film experience. Now there has been a film workshop with the Wild Rivers Film Workshop. So A Small Town Nutcracker Story was a film that came into being during COVID um, when the dance studio was shut down and there was not going to be a Nutcracker performance that year. And so the um, artistic director for the Wild Rivers uh, Coast Foundation for Dance wrote a screenplay mm-hmm. and then reached out to you and you brought a crew and we sort of crafted a film collectively. It was going to start out as a short videography and it ended up being a feature. So right. again, so you took on the role of director, but you also took on the role of actor and and you coached a, a team mm-hmm. that didn't have acting experience outside of the theater. So. I'd, right. I'd just like to hear you say more about balancing directing sure. and acting when you take on multiple roles. But I think that's not uncommon in small indie films. It's not It's not uncommon, especially having a... Um, but I, I, as an actor, was brought in... Uh, I was brought in as a replacement. Mm-hmm. So that's that right. wasn't announced uh, to anyone or, or really known until maybe about a week before, uh, maybe a week and a half. So I, I don't know. I probably had like 30 pages of dialogue. So... It added the whole benefit of the help that we had, who we brought from the East Coast, and also the help that we had in Brooklyn, Brookings with people, you know, being available to to make things work. We had people step up essentially as producers, um, and then I had a great cinematographer, Brian Wolfinger, um, 
you know, who Brian uh, just makes magic happen. Brian with make, lights. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I think America knows Brian on a first name basis in some ways, <laughs> you know, um, but um, it was also important to lean in on what you can change what you can't. Um, and then also there's the idea that um, you need to have help to do anything well. I mean, a, a director can't make anything work without a lot of people who are good at their job. So essentially directing is about also finding a team that, that works really well. So that materialized really quickly here. And then as the vision expanded into, oh, we can do a feature film. Oh, we, we are going to be greenlit to do that. And oh, uh, the script will be finished as we're going. You know, this is th these are things that happen in film. And the best laid plans, a film has a plan of a script, a storyboard, and the crew. And then things change from there. So you have to it, go with the flow. And you have to go with it. So, you know, wh whatever, I, I can't think of a job, you know, um, that I've ever done before that was as dynamic in terms of dealing with change and dealing with it gracefully as film, because uh, I'm sure theater is probably um, very much the same, except that it's live and there's no there's no cut and there's no there's no second take. But you also rehearse a lot before you even go on the first one. But um, in terms of the in terms of the the filming process and how we made that happen, it really wasn't just me. I, you know, and you know what I brought, I think, was acting skill, technique, and training for, you know, the the students who needed uh, a little bit of uh, direction here and there. But a lot of them were well cast for who they were. And um, and a lot of and DP stuff was just handled by Brian. I didn't have to do anything, you know, right. okay. to, 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 to assist with that vision. But, I, but we obviously worked on it whenever we did. But basically, I, need, I had needed Brian to be around Gina to be around, you know, um, Liam or sound mixer to just be on it all the time, which he was. That's, and, yes. and everyone was so flexible and dynamic to the situation that come weather or unexpected situations with anything that, cause weather changes also pretty quickly here in that season. It does. It, so, um, I don't remember how we did it, but I, <laughs> but I do know that we had help. So and then we had Sarai yeah. L who was seven at the time yeah. in the starring role. Uh, she's a phenomenal. I mean, th th there's a th th there's an idea of of what a person has when they have a force of nature of sorts. I mean, she totally has something, and and and, and Jack is, too. Yeah, Jack's and Jack's Jack's well theater trained. And by the way, like with this whole mention of like film training and acting, acting is acting. Like it, it isn't actually different. Theater training trains actors under more difficult circumstances. Actually, it's just you have to adapt that to the film medium, and so that's the part that might have been. The, you know where they had to make a transition to be smaller to to fit within the frame to understand camera blocking to understand that like when you cut you have to get back to your that was a challenge moment before for given circumstances and start there again yeah theater so trained yeah. the reflection of if you're a master at acting you can do film and theater that that there isn't really in my view the idea that there's just one medium that people can get really good at and you don't go to the other one theater absolutely informs and strengthens the instrument and muscle for film acting. And then film also informs theater acting in the sense of um, of the of the things that it's more difficult as. Of like, well, what if you're not feeling it that day? And what if the whole play isn't on a thing? Well, if film actors have to get right back to the moment instantly and then start start ready. So that training also gets people to put their own acting path into the space in a way that brings energy to the other actors that they can respond to. So film actors do bring something to theater too. There isn't just just one, but it, but if you had to pick one, it's probably better to start with theater and then move to move to film. Film, yeah. Well, I before we run out of time, I want to talk with you about whiskey floats. Sure, yeah. Um, such a charming short film with yeah such an important message. So, and we're going to get back to your role in directing now. Right. Uh, so, will you tell yeah. us a bit about this project? Right. Well, speaking of charming, this project couldn't have happened without um, a, another force of nature, Jay Dunnigan, who Jay Dunnigan, I, I like to joke, is a lot of people's favorite person. Um, he is impossible not to laugh at, with, with, at, with. Um, <laughs> um, and he's a, he's a fine human being. And yeah, he's one of my best friends. And he, like Nutcracker, I got brought in after the script was done. Um, after um, some other consider considerations have been made about casting, that film was already cast before I arrived. Uh, so credit to Jay. Um, he also workshopped the script with uh, Ken Gaucher, who wrote it. Um, hope I'm pronouncing your name, Ken, correctly. If not, I owe you um, a beer or a roast beef sandwich. But, um, but anyway, um, that 
that process happened because again, like the team was really strong. Like the the idea that a director deserves credit, a lead actor deserves credit, it's kind of an illusion. We see those people, you know, prominently, but directors and actors are really strong whenever the team is good. And that and we had um, we had award winning hair and makeup. We had you know a really really qualified sound mixer. I mean, just a, a longer like a, the longest. Excuse me, the sound mixer had the longest resume that I've worked with in recent memory. Like every every position was well hired already before I got there. So it was also at a sensitive time for me because um, because my mother was was ill uh, at the time, and she actually ended up you know if we can say this at this point in the interview, maybe it's too early to say this, but it's just absolutely dominant in my mind. But my mother passed away on the last day that we filmed that that short um, about the medical industry. And my mother had about with with what things, you know, can happen to people's lives and families' lives whenever medical industry has an influence. And I'm not making a comment on good or bad in people. You know, it's just the idea that this is a difficult process that we all deal with. And um, I was faced with a challenge that I needed to not tell the other people on set that it had happened. Because I, as many times as I thought about it in my head, I just thought it's, I, owed it, I owe it to everyone else that they finish this without being distracted at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then the process that me personally would go through after that was, was after that, you know. But in... But so I don't really know how to join that to everything else about the film, which has a life of its own. I mean, we won um, Indie Soul Award at Boston International Film Festival. I think it was the first film festival that I attended for it. It's probably on its way to getting some more. Um, but the reason why it all worked and the reason why it's such a heart centered place for me personally is the people that I work with are people that I love. It's a family. <laughs> actually. And yeah. And, and so that's something that's also a little bit more possible. You know, we could talk about what changes have happened with equipment technology with related to film and why you can make films for cheaper without just cutting budget randomly. Sometimes it's actually possible. That film had some things that were possible that wouldn't have been possible three or four years ago with the budget and personnel that we had. Um, But we still had the full crew. We just were able to do it more efficiently. Brian Wolfinger was cinematographer on that. He was a cinematographer again on that as well. Yeah. So it's beautifully shot. Beautifully shot. Cinematography is phenomenal. But then Jay Dunnigan plays Jeff, and he's got such a salty character. <laughs> right. He's right by the ocean. <laughs> Sounds like a sailor. Um, Jay, Jay's humor just came out in that, too. And speaking of weather changes, my goodness, that weather changed during that. So that's know, shot in script. Maine, which in some sense, I've people have watched it here in Brookings at the Art Walk. And right. they said, oh, was that shot locally? And yeah. it's like, no, that was across the country <laughs> in Maine. I think it's granite, maybe. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, no, it, it, it can be confused. You know, I think I actually had, I had a rock uh, from the beach in Brookings that I took out of my bag when I was shooting that in New York, Maine. And I looked at it while, because it might just keep it in my camera bag. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope I don't drop it because I won't know which one it is. Actually, <laughs> and here's the thing about Jay. Look, Jay's an actor, and he's getting cast in things, and he's and he's he's working through his career process. He also made a film. This is an issue that uh, th- this is a process, I should say, that people are going through now. You ha- kind of have to write your own ticket if you want your story to be told. There, you know, and that also comes with you know people who want to make projects like documentaries. Um, if you want to make a project that, of a film that you know you think the idea and then that idea's time has come. Yes. You can do that as an actor. Almost nothing happens anymore unless you do it. You know, it's not like the old studio system where they would choose an actor and you're the one and then that you you sign a contract and then maybe you're beholden to them and then, you know, you also have more artistic power now. You you have social media that has that can cut both ways, but you have a voice that you can control. And then they cast you knowing that you have a voice. That reaches an audience. So, so you have to have faith in yourself, and you have to have faith in a project. And the project has to be authentic. I think. Yes. For that to happen. And boy, do you need to have faith with yourself, everybody. <laughs> you know, like because because there's too there are too many no's. You know, to to make it without having faith in something. And I think faith in yourself and your craft is something that can help for sure. Well, we're running out of time. Yeah. But do you have any last thought that we you'd like to share that I didn't ask about? 
You know, um, related to related to the whiskey floats, I just want to thank everyone who um, who showed up so well. Everyone was early. Everyone was just so excited to be there. You know, um, I, I thank each and every one of you for supporting um, the vision that that Jay and Ken came up with, and then also, you know, for for me and in the condition that I was in because I had just you know left my left my family at that time, which um, the thing, the thing I'll say about that, you know, a gratitude for them. B, thank you so much, Brookings, for the film that we made here, and then the future of, for film here that that can create. Because I'm, I want to thank Brookings on behalf of Brookings. But the third thing I'll say is that, um, you know, I don't want to get too sentimental, um, you know. But with respect to my mom, I wasn't gonna. I did. The film had a budget, and it was set, and I needed to be there. And they were like, "You need to come um, for us." You know, that was the pressure. I, I need to go back and re-say that. I'm sorry. Um, so with respect to, I don't want to get too sentimental about it, but I also just need to say this one thing that may be of value to someone because I heard so many stories about people who lost someone during filming or or the industry wouldn't let them go back home, you know, to to family at an important moment. Like weddings and funerals are just things that I've just gotten used to missing sometimes. And it's the part that, you know, is not my favorite part. Um, but when I was on, I was, I was at the hospital. My mother was not going to be with us for more than a week after that point. And I spoke with her during her last words. And I asked her what she was thinking, what she was doing, you know, what are you experiencing? And she said, well, I was, I was dreaming. And that was it. And I said, okay, well, what were you dreaming about? And she said, um, I was I was uh, I was thinking about the play, and then we had gotten it out of her that that she was talking about this play, the King and I, that she had put the the wardrobe together for years ago. And this was in 2022. That play was put on in the 70s. This is what she was dreaming about in 2022. Still, absolutely essential to who she was. Absolutely, yeah, and I. I knew because after I consulted my family, it's like, I know this is going to be really consequential. I don't have to go. I, I can stay here. My mother wasn't waking up at the point at that point. And then they said, if she was thinking of that, if she was thinking about that, it means that she would want you to do what was right for you and for this, because all of this was still going to lead to something more. So I dedicated it to her. It was a really tough choice, but it was a thing that that that's how life's timing works, you know. And and there, I I do, I've never found a great way to tell this story in public because it's just life doesn't happen on your schedule. Like it totally doesn't. But I knew at least that stories were really important because my mother had all kinds of life until then, and that's what she was thinking of. So if I can give someone through my work, even the people just on set the ability to do what they love to do in their artistic craft by making this story, then it's worth that moment. I, I, it's just worth some sacrifice. And, you know, and it, it's, it's important to, it's important to sacrifice things sometimes to understand that what you're doing has value and is important. And then it's also important to be really, really good if you want to make a difference, because there are a lot of things that stop you. So if you're really, 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 really good, people can't say no. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Of course. Um, Sorry I went long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, if you're just joining us, you're listening to the Wild Rivers Film Radio. I'm Sue Wright. That's it for this episode of the Wild Rivers Film Radio. If you want to learn more about the festival, buy passes, volunteer for us, or even sign up for a sponsorship, you can learn more and get connected at the WildRiversFilmFestival.com. You can also find the festival on Facebook and Instagram. Recording was done by Tom Bozak. Mixing and editing was done by Kat Liddell. Our producer is Amanda Whitmore. Today's guest was Rob Douthat, and I'm Sue Wright. See you next time.